President Biden proposes the biggest overhaul of the U.S. economy since the New Deal. And finally, he tells us what he believes the riches' fair share really is. Good evening, I'm Leland Vittert. Democrats have adopted the saying, go big or go home, in a way not since seen since Franklin Roosevelt. Here is the president today. Or are we going to take this moment right now to set this country on a new path? One that invests in this nation, creates real sustained economic growth, and that benefits everyone, including working people and middle class folks. That's something we haven't realized in this country for decades. President Biden is proposing a massive new New Deal, rewriting the social contract in America with a $3.5 trillion spending plan that touches every American's life from cradle to grave. Here's Senator Bernie Sanders explaining all the free things we'll get. We've got to lower the cost of prescription drugs for people. We've got to expand Medicare to include dental, hearing aids, and eyeglasses. We have to maintain the $300 direct payment we're giving to working parents, which have lowered childhood poverty in America by 50%. And I'll tell you what else we have got to do. The scientists will tell us that we got a few years left before there will be irreparable, irreversible harm to our planet if we do not address climate change. Mr. Biden says he's going to pay for it all using an age-old Democratic talking point. Big corporations and super wealthy have to start paying their fair share of taxes. It's long overdue. But in fact, the super wealthy already do pay the lion's share of taxes. The top 20% of taxpayers paid 78% of federal income taxes in 2020. This is from the Tax Policy Center. That's up from 2019. The top 1% of taxpayers paid 28% of taxes in 2020. More than 100 million Americans, 100 million U.S. households, 61% of all taxpayers paid not a dime in federal income taxes last year. For President Biden, that is not enough. We need a corporate tax, he says, that is higher than communist China and income taxes that take away 60 cents of every dollar earned by the richest Americans in some states. But he promised today that he won't raise taxes on people making less than $400,000 a year. What he failed to say is that over the past year, there has already been a huge tax hike on the middle class in the form of inflation, which is a direct result of the massive government spending over the past 12 months. The headline from Bloomberg says it all. Priciest food since 1970 is a big challenge for governments. Prices for meat, eggs, coffee, and milk are all up. In some cases, double digits, and the report says those increases will continue. Take a couple of items that you buy every day. Gas, up a dollar from 218 to 319, more than 40% in a year. Then there's buying clothes online. Typically, prices of clothing online drop about 1% every year. This year, it's up 15%. And the cost of used cars is also up big. In Madison, Wisconsin, for example, prices are up 41%, a $7,000 increase compared to last year. And it's going to get even worse. According to a report from our friends at Axios, expect to pay more as retailers pass down cost increases in transportation, labor, and commodities. Turkeys are already in short supply. Expect to pay more if you can find them because grocery stores already say they face shortages. President Biden says he's confident Congress is going to pass his massive spending package. But it's far from a foregone conclusion. At least one Democratic senator, Joe Manchin of West Virginia, is publicly rallying against it. At times like this, we bring another great West Virginian in, Chris Steyerwalt, the man himself, 20 years, a reporter and scribe in Washington, D.C., and a good friend of the show. All right, Chris, uh, isn't taxing the rich always popular? Why is this a big challenge for the president to get through? Well, uh, look, 
if Joe Biden, yes, t taxing the rich is always popular, period. And it's a bipartisan, it, it's while Republican politicians have tended to uh, avoid it, we know that it's popular with 70% of voters. Depending on how you ask the question, most voters like the idea of rich people paying more taxes. They like it. Uh, but the problem for Biden is he wants this spending package. But his economic advisors have told him that if they put through this much money without a tax increase in it, right, that inflation is just going to get worse. Because what causes inflation is when you have too much money circulating, chasing too few things. There are, it's not that there are too few turkeys necessarily. It's just that we have a lot of people who have a lot more money than they did before because the federal government gave so much away last year. So now you have all of that money chasing too few turkeys, uh, and that makes the turkeys uh, more expensive expensive. Biden knows that if they dump that much more money into the economy again without pulling on the brake cord a little bit there with a the tax increase, that things will get out of control. But because of those tax increases, this spending plan is even harder to get through Congress because no Republicans are going to sign on for any of that stuff. And it just makes the pathway so much more narrow for Biden as he tries to get it done. Yeah, you think about inflation, uh, which is sort of uh a conceptual term that's a little bit hard for so many Americans, especially in my generation, because uh, we didn't live through the 70s of gas lines and double digit inflation where your, your dollar was truly worth less tomorrow than it is today. Uh, that plays to the administration's favor, correct? Well, look, uh, basically, in uh, during the last financial crisis, during the, the panic of 2008, the idea that uh, borrowing too much money wasn't a problem anymore uh, came into vogue. Modern monetary policy became the vogue in Washington, first among the Democrats, then among the Republicans. When Republicans had the economy growing like gangbusters, 4% a year, they still borrowed an extra trillion dollars. And fuddy-duddies like me said, if you borrow too much money, your country is going to get into trouble. And everybody said, no, we can borrow indefinitely. What they are now catching up with over a decade, more than a decade of really, really aggressive deficit at spending is you get inflation because you're just dumping all of that money fake money, conjured money made up by the Federal Reserve and the federal government into the economy, and it gets out of whack with the number of goods that are available, and it's going to drive prices up. That's yeah. just how it works, and, and it's always worked that way, but as you say, people forget. And, and we're seeing a little bit of the beginnings of that, but there's not enough inflation to explain these numbers. Uh, Biden's handling of the economy, 4252 underwater disapprove 52%. Uh, if you listen to President Biden, things are going great in the economy. They've created new jobs. Stock market's near an all-time high. Uh, what are people upset about? Well, what's he going to do? He's not going to come out, you know, uh, he's, he's taking the Trump page, right? You could, how's everything? It's the greatest ever. People are saying it's the best economy ever. Presidents always say that. That's what they're going to do. The truth is people are concerned about the coronavirus and they're concerned about the reaction to the coronavirus. The biggest thing on Biden's plate right now, it's not this, this spending package that Joe Manchin is going to make sure is not any $3.5 trillion. And Kristen Sinema from Arizona and others are not going to let that happen. These packages are really important for his future and whether or not Democrats uh, have a bad year or a terrible year next year in midterms. The biggest question for all of that and for the country, can they get enough people vaccinated? Can enough people get vaccinated so that we get to a point where people can lift the restrictions? Because we've been on this roller coaster ride now where businesses and individuals ramped up spending at the beginning of the summer. They said, hey, it's going to be good. Delta variant comes through and we have a a splotchy, yeah. patchy reaction to it. Vaccination rates fall, people freak out, and consequently, the economy slows down. That's what Biden's paying right. the price for right now, and that's why he's pushing so hard on vaccines. Uh, 20 seconds, uh, 3.5 trillion is, and we did the math on this, 3,500 piles of a billion dollars. Uh, forget the <sighs> American people. Do people even in Washington realize now how much money they're spending or have the numbers stopped mattering? You let me just get half one of those piles. I'll be good. You never have to hear from me again. Um, look, the, the, the reality is the reason we can't let politicians run deficits like this is it makes them unaccountable and it doesn't uh, it doesn't work. You have to make them balance the books to mm -hmm. some degree or otherwise you end up in the soup like this. Yeah, we're we're in the soup for sure. Um, and, and you're here with us. It's good soup whenever you're around, Chris. Thank you. <laughs> you bet. <laughs> All right. The Chinese Communist Party mouthpiece now says Chinese warships will be off the coast of Hawaii and sailing the Caribbean soon. We talked about this briefly last night after the Chinese warships sailed close to Alaska. 
but then found this speech just given by General John Hyten. He's the vice chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. He was talking about the rapid building of nuclear weapons and ICBM silos by the Chinese. And when you look at that nuclear capability and you look at China's declared no first use policy and what they have nuclear weapons for, you have to ask yourself, why are they building that enormous, enormous uh, nuclear capability faster than anybody in the world? Now, wh why do you need nuclear weapons if you're not going to use them? We're going to get to that in a minute, but we want to come over to the touch screen to show you where these nuclear weapons are, and it's not an accident. You might remember this satellite photo we showed you a couple of months ago, way up by Mongolia. This right here is one of those inflatable tents, something that you might play tennis in uh, the winter in Minneapolis in. Underneath there is a missile silo, and there are dozens all around here. We're going to switch maps now. This is one of the construction areas. Switch maps to show you where this is. Along Mongolia, this is far, far western China. Training site in these new missile silos here, a laser base here to attack U.S. satellites. Put this in perspective of where this map is, and you'll understand how key the past three months have been. This is Bagram Air Base in Afghanistan. This was the closest U.S. air base to all of these sites inside of western China. The U.S. giving up Bagram has enormous, enormous significance in terms of our ability to project force in to Western China. No U.S. air bases over here until you get all the way down to Qatar and the UAE. Now we'll tell you why China is so excited, because they've been waiting for this moment. They have been increasing their Navy. Already, their Navy outnumbers the entire U.S. Navy. You can see destroyers here, frigates, corvettes, submarines now outnumber the United States aircraft carriers. We outnumber them they're building more. And if you look at some of our NATO allies here and then the Australians, they are dwarfed by the Chinese. To counter the explosion of Chinese naval power, President Biden announced yesterday selling Australia nuclear-powered but not nuclear-armed submarines. It sounds meaningful until you realize the submarines to challenge all the Chinese submarines here are not going to be in the water until 2024. Sorry, 2040. We bring in retired General Jerry Boykin, former Undersecretary of Defense for Intelligence, Dr. Rebecca Grant, who spent decades with the Air Force and studying the Chinese military and their weapons, now in the private sector. Pre appreciate you both of us uh, being there. Uh, Dr. Grant, I guess 2024 would be a lot better than 2040 to get these in the water, huh? Well, the, the deal, this is the best news I've heard all week because it's great that we are going to have Britain and the U.S. and Australia share in the building of the nuclear submarines. It's a really big change for Australia, and it underscores the strength of that important strategic relationship with Australia. This will help us build undersea superiority, and that is absolutely critical to the naval battles and the naval balance in the Pacific. It's a great way to get after after China. General Boykin, I, I think about this, put the political issues aside in terms of whether there's the political will in Washington to really confront China. You just look at that figure of how much China is investing in its military while uh, our military is, shall we say, uh, concerned with other issues. Are we at the point of no return that the Chinese are destined to become peer-to-peer -peer with the U.S. military? Oh, uh, yes. Absolutely, I think so. But keep in mind, uh, first of all, I agree with Dr. Grant in terms of the uh, submarine program with the Australians, but, but keep in mind that uh, the Navy, the, the Chinese Navy, even though it does have aircraft carriers, uh, it takes a long time to be able to uh, really know how to use those effectively. What they don't have is they don't have uh, a robust uh, deployment capability. They don't have a robust power projection capability. Uh, and when they get that, uh, we need to really be worried. But uh, you, you have to ask the question, how many nukes is enough? How many do you really need? And we have no agreements with them right now that would uh, cause them to either limit the production of these nukes or reduce the number of nukes. I I'm going to stop you for a second. I just didn't quite understand what the video we were showing is, but we'll We'll get back to some video from China in a minute. Um, General, you were in the intelligence business for a long time. The CIA uh, suffered some major losses inside of China. They were, all their spy networks were rounded up by the Chinese intelligence services. Do we really have visibility on what's going on inside China and what they intend to do with all these new weapons and new ships? 
Uh, we have visibility. Uh, it's not as good as what the Chinese have in America. I mean, they, you know, you have to look at how they've infiltrated our institutions of higher education as well as our laboratories and uh, just about every element of our society. So, yes, we have some visibility, but it is not it is not up to the same par as what they have against us. Speaking of uh, that, uh, Rebecca, we watched, I think you watched, I watched President Biden's speech yesterday announcing this, and yet didn't hear him mention China once. How, how do we believe that he's that clear-headed about the threat of China if he's not willing to call him out? We're still getting a lot of word soup about competing and extreme competition, but President Biden and the rest of his team need to be blunt like the Australians are and recognize that China is an adversary. And we have to say, hey, we're not going to let China dominate the Pacific. And we're doing this deal with Australia to keep our alliances strong. The words from Team Biden really need to match the actions, and they need to be a lot stronger to push back and to deter China. Uh, so far, I haven't heard the White House say much about this video that just came out in the past couple of hours. This is of a North Korean missile launch, which in and of itself would not be that surprising. But when we play the video, show you, we'll show you why it's important, which is the missile comes out of a train car, uh, which I believe, uh, Dr. Grant, is the first time they've ever done that, correct? Right. That's right. Is that significant or not? Yes, it really is. And if you notice, the rail track is coming out of a tunnel. Now, I usually ignore these short-range tests because it's an older missile, but this one really matters because it's a real take-that kind of display. And they're showing that they can prepare and fuel and get this missile ready for launch inside that deep rail tunnel with much less tense of detection. We can't see it. We won't know it's coming. Mm -hmm. And that is a new capability, this rail launch that they're showing. Really, really pretty worrying, I would say, in this case, even though it still is a short-range missile. Uh, General, lastly to you, uh, as we're surveying the world right now, we've got the Russians, the Iranians, uh, the Chinese, now the North Koreans getting uh, frisky. Of those, which one concerns you the most? Clearly China. Okay. China. Uh, I'm tired of uh, hearing that climate change is the number one uh, uh, threat in the future. Uh, no, it's China. And, and I, I care about the environment very much, but it's China. Got it. All right. Thank you very much. We appreciate it. Obviously, um, this issue is not going away, as you both point out. We'll talk to you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Mom, what can I say? I'm just sorry. We've just been fighting this morning. Some personal issues. It was a long day. We were camping yesterday, and camping got tough. That's body cam footage of a police encounter this August with Gabby Petito and her boyfriend. The couple was driving through the America West. Her boyfriend returned. She did not. He's now considered a person of interest in the case, but earlier today, Florida police say they have seen no evidence of a crime. We're going to walk you through the timeline here. Police responded to that altercation between the couple about a month ago. Gabby's family says they haven't heard from her since the end of last month about a couple of weeks after the fight. On August 25th, she posted on her social media for the last time since her disappearance. Fast forward to September 1st, when her boyfriend returned home from the camping trip with the van, with her van, but without her. 10 days later, Gabby's family reported her missing. Brian Enton, live outside the boyfriend's house tonight in Florida, where uh, you haven't seen him and he hasn't said much, right? Yeah, we definitely haven't seen him, and neither have the police. They've been trying to talk to him for days, and they say he simply will not budge. He won't give interviews, and it's very, very frustrating to detectives. We believe uh, that he's still inside this house behind me. It's his parents' house, and we believe that he's held up there. But it's just heartbreaking, this whole situation. Today, Gabby's family wrote a letter to the boyfriend's parents basically saying, please, please let your son speak. We believe he's the only one who knows the last place Gabby was, and even saying, look, if we're searching in the wrong area right now, please at least just let us know. Where they're searching is important. It's Grand Teton National Park, which is some of the most rugged parts of America. If you've ever been out there, we have a satellite image to show you. 45 miles by 26 miles. For perspective, you could fit more than 20 Manhattans inside of it. And you can see it's the middle of a rock, uh, the mountain range there, the Teton Mountain Range, uh, Jackson Lake there uh, in it. So 
there's you can see relative to Manhattan. Uh, do they understand where they're searching in here, or is this now sort of trying to search for clues to figure out where to search? It's basically a needle in a haystack. I mean, you summed it up there with just how big it is. We know that Gabby's stepdad has headed, headed out to that area with family members to try and start searching. The FBI very, very much involved uh, in this entire investigation. They've got lots of technology where they can trace cell phones and that kind of things and track the cell phones. But the issue is there's not a lot of cell phone yeah. service in that area. Uh, so real, it's real really quick, making Brian, things difficult. You know, missing, missing people happen all the time. The FBI doesn't come in and investigate and pour the kind of resources they have. Uh, is there anything you've gotten from your sources or just sort of some tea leaves you've picked up on of, of why they think they, why the police think they really need to pay attention to this, even though they can't yet say it's a crime? Because none of it makes any sense and because Brian Laundrie isn't talking. This is his fiance, a woman who he says he's loved, who he was very, very close to, who was, he was on the road with for months uh, and documenting it all on social media. If he loved this woman so much, mm. uh, Gabby's family is saying, why would he be in hiding? Why wouldn't he be out screaming you know, to the, to the world, help us find uh, Gabby? Yeah, uh, that, is, that is a great question. Uh, Brian, keep up the fantastic reporting. We know it's been some long days, but thank you. Thanks, Leland. All right, coming up, new internal documents show what Facebook does to mess with kids' mental health. We'll show you how they ignore the danger in name of profits and also talk about how to protect your kids. Plus, the federal government is about to drop millions on capital security this weekend, but are they just getting punked Why the beefed-up security in D.C. might just be a waste of your money. Well, the protective fence is back up surrounding the nation's capital, and the National Guard is on standby ahead of a rally this Saturday in support of those who participated in January's deadly riots. But the Proud Boys and other far-right groups are telling their supporters not to show up. News Nation correspondent Allison Harris in Washington, D.C., to explain that for us. Hi, Allison. Hi, Leland. The Capitol behind me looks more like a fortress tonight. The fencing is back up. Capitol Police are taking this seriously. They won't be caught off guard again like they were on January 6th. President Trump told his supporters to be there and be wild on January 6th. Today, he said in a statement, his supporters have been persecuted so unfairly. More than 600 have been arrested in the deadly attack. Many held without bail, hence the rally for justice Saturday. Now, far-right Facebook groups and forums online warn, do not attend the FBI rally, saying those coming Saturday will be entrapped by federal agents. Roger Stone received a Trump pardon and remains a steadfast supporter supporter of the former president. It's a setup. I don't know a single person who's going. I'm not going. The D.C. National Guard is on standby for Saturday, and Leland, we're learning tonight that there are even threats for tomorrow, and that 200 D.C. police officers are being hired. They're being paid overtime to work tomorrow because of those threats ahead of Saturday's rally. Yeah, understanding a lot of congressional officers also are uh, working remotely tomorrow. Allison, thanks so much. While the police are getting ready to protect the Capitol and its lawmakers, many politicians haven't even mentioned Saturday's rally, especially Republicans. This headline in the New York Times, Republicans wary of political fallout steer clear of rally for riot suspects. The Justice for J6 rally planned for Saturday on the Capitol has presented a dilemma for Republicans who are toiling to, to avoid dredging up memories of the January 6th riot. Co-author of the Politico playbook, Tara Palmieri, with us now. Uh, all right, Tara, you, Republicans are normally quite vocal on this issue, especially the Freedom Caucus. Why the silence now? I just don't think there's any winning uh, when being associated with January 6th. Um, it was a day that was deadly, like you said earlier. Um, it's now being taken over by the fringe. And while Republicans may say that the election was stolen, um, they don't want to support violence um, and, and another riot outside of uh, the Capitol. They know there are legal repercussions. I mean, all these people are being prosecuted that were a part of it. They don't want to have that sort of legal exposure by encouraging people to riot again in case it gets violent and deadly again. Mm. So I just don't think there's any winning in attaching yourself to January 6th. 
although we've seen, so you're, you're sort of drawing this distinction, I guess what I'm understanding is, between Republicans like Matt Gates and Marjorie Taylor Greene and the like, who will say the election mm -hmm. stolen and continue that, but then the mm -hmm. defending of those who stormed the Capitol, has that pretty much ended among Republicans? No, I think that they still, some defend them, like Marjorie Taylor Greene and Matt Gates. They think that they're being unfairly prosecuted. And some mainstream Republicans might say the same thing, too, saying that compared to rioters in, um, you know, in other movements like Black Lives Matter, that they're being um, unfairly prosecuted. But at the end of the day, it's something that the Republican Party really wants to move past because Democrats can use January 6th, the fear of violence, the fringe part of the party as a way to keep the House in yeah. 2022. Yeah, well, certainly there's a couple of networks who have been covering the uh, installation of the fence uh, breathlessly and uh, will be so on uh, <laughs> Saturday as well. Tara, great seeing you as always. We'll, uh, we know you got to get to bed and we'll read more in the note this, tomorrow morning. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. All right, if you look at the New York Times COVID map, you'd think the United States was the worst spot for COVID in the world. We're going to show you why you just might be wrong. Plus this, evictions during the pandemic have been a flashpoint for Democrats, but now they're flipping the script for the unvaccinated. A look at the hypocrisy when we come back. An Oklahoma woman says she and her two-year-old son, who was suffering an asthma attack, were kicked off a flight because he refused to wear a mask. The flight was leaving Dallas, heading to Colorado Springs on Monday, when it was forced back to the gate. Spokesman for American Airlines told the Daily Mail the toddler was out of his seat as the plane was on an active runway. They were not informed he was having an asthma attack. We're told the family was later rebooked on another flight. Italy has now become the first EU country to mandate a COVID green pass for everyone who has a job. Starting October 15th, all workers in Italy are required to either show proof of vaccination, a negative test, or a recent recovery from infection or they face massive fines, employers are also required to check them. Back here at home, there's growing pushback against President Biden's vaccine mandate. The Job Creators Network, which is a small business advocacy group, reportedly prepared to sue the Biden administration over requiring vaccines at businesses with more than 100 workers. The group's calling it unconstitutional, a dramatic overreach of federal authority. Watch that lawsuit. Amid the debate over whether your boss can force you to get the vaccine, can your landlord force you to get the vaccine? It's already happening in Florida. A Miami area landlord is demanding his residents get the shot or their leases will not be renewed. And apparently no exceptions. The landlord saying, quote, you don't want to get vaccinated, you have to move. And if you don't move, one must move forward with eviction. With that, we bring in Bob Bianchi, attorney and counselor at law. Good to see you, sir. Thank you. Uh, all right, Wild West here, but are the unvaccinated a protected class for housing law? Well, we'll find out with this case, Leland. This one is really kind of twisty and kind of heady. So, you know, usually landlords under the law are given a great wide breadth of discretion to do what they think is necessary to protect the health, safety, and welfare of its citizens. But now you have a state law that says that, no, Mr. Alvarez, you cannot do this. You cannot require that people show a vaccine passport, if you were, if they've been vaccinated. So it's going to be interesting. And I think where the wiggle room in this case, Leland, interestingly, is going to be the law says for patrons and customers and also with regard to places that sell goods and services. So I believe what the landlord's lawyers are going to do here is say these aren't goods and services. These are not customers and patrons. They are property owners, if you will, quote unquote, through a lease. So the interesting twist here, will the, will the governor and the legislature say, you know what, let's add landlords and tenants into this law. And then if they do that, you're going to see a real court face off on this one. Well, and it's in Florida where Ron DeSantis, we know, likes, likes to have these fights. He views them as politically expedient. If this was, for example, say in New York, then the, the landlord would be just fine. Yeah, there, there's no question about it. And that's okay. the problem with what we have here. We have the disparate treatment in different states handling things differently. And that's why ultimately these issues are probably going to go to the federal courts because the federal courts have a better, wider jurisdiction across the entire country. But even in the federal courts, Leland, they're split on a lot of these issues. Uh, we found this with the, from a tweet from the Occupy Democrats, which are folks who are normally uh, against eviction. Uh, and he loved the eviction moratorium, but they sent out this news story and said, retweet if you support 
uh, the landlords move. Uh, with the eviction moratorium as it stands, protect people from being evicted for being unvaccinated, which would sort of throw this into a whole nother orbit? I don't think so. I think the eviction moratorium is with respect to people who cannot financially afford uh, okay. to live in their homes. That can be debated. This is a little bit of a different issue because it's, it's talking about vaccines, not money. Huh. All right. Well, the, the rhetoric continues. Um, remaining unvaccinated in public, according to one CNN analyst writing the Washington Post, should be considered as bad as drunk driving. Uh, you kill somebody drunk driving, there's special penalties. Uh, versus just getting into a car accident. If you give, does this mean that if you give somebody COVID and you are unvaccinated, is there a way to charge you with a crime? You know, that, Leland, we kind of touched around the edges on this uh, on, on another show that we did here. That's a great question because if you know you have some sort of lethal disease, it's not the first time that this issue's ever been presented, and you do not uh, do anything to prevent somebody else from getting it, it could be considered reckless. And sometimes in the criminal statutes, recklessness that causes a death what, is what Weren't there some laws about that with HIV at one point? Yeah, they, they, there were actually a lot of discrimination that went on with respect to it. So to your point, how the tables have flipped with regard to the people on the political spectrum, there's no question about it. But the courts aren't going to care about the conservative side or the liberal side. They're going to care about the legal side, whether or not it's lawful. All right. Hey, Bob, great conversation as always. Thank you for it. And uh, the legal fights will continue with COVID for sure. You got it, Leland. Thank yeah. you. Well, speaking of COVID, this map from the New York Times caught our eye. Here it is. You see the United States in dark maroon, except that's not the right map. So it would be scary if you saw the right map. It appears to show America is the worst in the world for COVID. There it is. You see the United States in dark maroon and the rest of the world in less scary colors. So it got us thinking. America spends by far the most on health care per capita in the world and by far 30% more than Switzerland. Americans spend is roughly $11,000 per person per year on health care. Switzerland, $7,000. India, just $257. But if you look at that map, America is the worst for COVID. We had our resident statistician, Liberty Vitter, professor of data science at Washington University, features editor at the Harvard Data Science Review, and Mark and Carol Vitter's favorite child look into this. Uh, so why are we so much worse than everywhere but Mongolia, Liberty? Well, there's a couple of issues at play here, and the first is testing. So the more testing you do, inevitably, the more positive tests you will have. And the U.S. is testing at a very high rate. So we have a graphic here to show you what the testing looks like for countries across the world. So we will be putting up that graphic, and it will have dark blue colored countries shown that are testing at a rate that is similar or higher than the United States. And that means that all of the countries in gray here are testing at lower rates so that irregardless of COVID numbers, they will simply show less positive tests because they are testing less. So we have to understand that since we're doing a lot of testing in the U.S., we are going to inevitably have more positive tests. Hmm. Okay, so is it just about testing? No, we have a second issue at play here, and that's that other countries are either not reporting data at all, or they are, we're, they're questionable in their data, either misleading intentionally or unintentionally. So we have a graphic to show you how we can put this all together to understand where the U.S. is. First, the New York Times graph was very visually deceiving because there are 21 other countries that have a much higher rate of new COVID cases than the United States. But because of that dark color that was used on the New York Times graph, we were really visually deceived. So those countries are colored here in light orange. Second, we have almost 100 countries on that same graphic where they're not reporting the data or they're testing at such a low rate, we really don't know what's going on. And those are colored in dark orange. And finally, on this graph, we have countries in red where the data is so suspect that we have no idea 
idea what's going on here. So overall, all of the colored countries on this map are most likely doing worse than the United States in terms of new COVID cases. And the countries in gray are doing the same or better. That means that about two thirds of the countries in the world are doing worse than the US and about one third are doing the same or better. So the New York Times graph showing that the US is the worst is most certainly not the case. Okay, and we have to point out the New York Times is about cases, not about deaths or hospitalizations, which certainly vaccine rates play a huge part of. Is that the answer to this? Unfortunately, no. The metric that everyone keeps using to measure the vaccine or herd immunity of other countries is new COVID cases, and that's not the right metric to use at all. The vaccine isn't stopping all new cases of COVID, especially with this highly transmissible Delta variant. You can still catch COVID when you've been vaccinated. But what the vaccine is doing is preventing hospitalizations and deaths. Mm -hmm. And the reason we know this is because the number of people in the hospitals that are unvaccinated is 17 times more wow. the number of people in hospitals that are vaccinated. Mm -hmm. So as you keep saying, we can't manage the cases to zero, but the vaccine is doing what we really care about, which is stopping people from dying. Yeah, and clearly there's so many parts of the world that don't have the vaccine and certainly don't have the medical care uh, the United States does. Liberty, thank you. Still ahead, we know Facebook is bad for our kids, but it turns out Facebook knew it too. We're going to show you the manipulated moves the company made to get more children hooked. We are learning incredible and frankly some scary information about a company that knows more about you than even you might. Of course, we're talking about Facebook. The Wall Street Journal obtained internal documents showing Facebook's inner workings and how it knowingly manipulated users' psychology for profits while disregarding the dangers and damage it does to kids. All right, we'll go through the Wall Street Journal reports. Facebook says its rules apply to all company documents reveal a secret elite that is exempt. A program known as XCheck has given millions of celebrities, politicians, other high-profile users special treatments, a privilege many abuse. Next headline, Facebook knows Instagram is toxic for teen girls. Company documents show its own in-depth research shows a significant teen mental health issue about Facebook that it downplays in public. All right, as the Wall Street Journal puts it, quote, Facebook tried to make its platform a healthier place and it got angrier instead. Internal memos show how a big 2018 change rewarded outrage and that CEO Mark Zuckerberg resisted proposed fixes. Another headline from the Wall Street Journal. Facebook employees flag drug cartels and human traffickers. The company's response is weak and slow. Of course, big tobacco, alcohol makers, just about every other consumer product company tries to prey on consumers' weaknesses to drive sales. But the Journal's reporting shows Facebook takes that to a new level. Joining us, Wendy Dickinson, licensed psychologist, founder of Grow Restored, a counseling and leadership development organization, along with Dr. Catherine Coleman, clinical psychologist who treats patients suffering from PTSD, depression, and other issues. Uh, ladies, thank you for being with us. Uh, Dr. Dickinson, it, I guess it shouldn't surprise us uh, that this is happening, but is there a way to protect ourselves other than just deleting a Facebook account? Well, I think we have to be educated and we have to be wise about what's going on. And we more than anything else have to help educate our teens about the way these platforms are designed. They're designed to be addictive. Um, every time something refreshes or you get a, another like, you get a hit of dopamine, which causes you to come back. It's the feel good chemical. And it's really important that we educate, especially our teens, but also ourselves on what's going on here. And the fact that you have to be careful about the amount of social media that you're consuming. So, Dr. Coleman, when, when you say, when you hear a hit of dopamine, is that the same thing that happens if you take uh, an illegal drug of some type, or what does it compare to for the rest of us? So dopamine, it's, it's what makes you feel good. And so that's really what keeps addictions going. So yes, it could be a drug, uh, but dopamine also 
gets released when you pet your dog and you see your dog when you walk in the house at the first time. And so it's these feelings of elation um, and joy and love that start to be released whenever you're doing something that you enjoy. Mm -hmm. And so as Dr. Dickinson had mentioned, you know, when you refresh that screen, whenever you get a like, whenever you get a new comment, that that releases dopamine and that feeling gets reinforced over time. Yeah, and clear, clearly they know that that's happening and they've designed the algorithm uh, that way. This Wall Street Journal op-ed uh, caught our eye. It's from a philosophy professor, so somewhat in the same realm. What have I done to deserve this? America's obsession with indiscriminate affection and affirmation has me wondering whether I've really earned it. Apparently, I deserve affordable health care, high-speed internet access, deserve to retire with dignity, and he goes on and on. Uh, is social media, Dr. Dickinson, any, any part of this, that th this all sort of all becomes about me and me and me? as I look through Instagram? Yeah, I think we have to keep in mind that it's a bit of a warped reality, right? It's not the same thing as having relationships with people face to face. There's there's a, a self focus that can happen um, that leads you down all kinds of different paths, thinking that things are all about you, having an imposter syndrome. We know that it leads to higher levels of anxiety, depression, isolation, loneliness. So there's a lot of ways that it changes your perception about what's real, and and really causes us to start to question what's going on. We had a privacy expert on uh, earlier in the week to talk specifically about uh, the Instagram issues as it relates to teenagers and how they sort of really prey upon uh, teenagers. Take a listen. Their whole goal is to keep you addicted. And when you constantly get people to react and respond to every waking thought and image that their friends have, you're going to breed insanity. And that's part of what they've done here. Dr. Coleman, it's a little bit different uh, when you prey on adults than when you prey on kids. Specifically as it relates to teenagers, is there a difference here between how teenage boys and teenage girls deal with this? Absolutely. The, and it really comes down to the, the way that the brain has not developed yet um, into adulthood. Adolescent and child brains are, they have a lot of elasticity, which means, which is great for learning. It means that they are kind of like a sponge and they can soak, soak things up. But what that also means is that they are far more susceptible and vulnerable to this kind of manipulation. Hmm. All right. Uh, ladies, appreciate it. Great conversation here. And, um, Unfortunately, we don't have enough time to get to some of the more pressing issues about really how do we protect kids uh, from this. Perhaps some of the responsibility lies with uh, Facebook. Uh, Dr. Dickinson, Dr. Coleman, great conversation. We'll have you both back. Thank you. Good to see you. Their love is unwavering and it is un unconditional. So we wanted to give a little love back, an ode to pets and one pet of a friend, especially when we come back. Bittersweet moment to leave you on. A good friend of mine, Carl Rove, wrote a touching op-ed in the Wall Street Journal today. The piece was an ode to Carl's late dog, Little Bit. Little Bit died about two weeks ago. She was three years old. Like so many of our pets at home, Carl says Little Bit helped him and his family stay sane during the lockdowns. In writing, God grants us pets to encourage us to give and receive unconditional love, to see loyalty personified, and to remind us that we must balance joy and delight with loss and grief in this transitory life. That line got our team thinking about the pets in our lives. So with that, a shout out to the pets of On Balance. We were supposed to have a picture of them, but it didn't show up. So Moose, Brody, Sugar, Autumn, Lucy, Donut, we love you. And thank you for teaching us so much. There they are. Prime's next.